Welcome, welcome everyone to a video that should give you a comprehensive beginner's guide to create mod for Vault Hunters 118. If you're not playing the Vault Hunters 118 mod pack, don't despair, this will still be a beginner's guide, but the recipes will be different, and when I'm talking about stuff like chromatic iron or chromatic steel or anything that you're like, that's not in my mod pack, it's probably Vault Hunter specific. All right, PSA out of the way, let's get right into the guide. This is going to be the basics of everything in Create Mod. Something that spins. This is probably going to be your first source of kinetic energy or rotational force or stress units, whichever one you want to call it. I'm going to call it stress units. A water wheel. This little fella is pretty darn cheap and will power not much, at least not on its own. When I break this glass and look at it, I can see it's generating 192SU. How can I see that? With these goggles. These guys are great, and they do cost a gold sheet, which we'll get into how to make later, but just know you're probably going to want these because they give you extra information on all of your machines. I only see the generator stats because I'm wearing the goggles. If the goggles go off, so do the stats. So let's examine our watery friend here. First of all, you need flowing water to make it move. Second of all, it's got teeth, and just like a real water wheel, we wouldn't want the water going against the teeth, that's going to be inefficient. We want the water going into the teeth. And this way, it produces 192 SU. But there is a better way, as some of you keen-eyed viewers might note, there's teeth on the back. But how do you get water to flow up? Well, this is Minecraft, so I'm sure plenty of you know how to get water to flow up. Introducing the star of efficient water wheels and my good personal friend, Soul Sand. Replace this block with soul sand and fill in some water sources and you will get a water wheel that is supercharged generating 256 SU. Now 256 SU is pretty incredible, but what if I told you water wheels could be faster? Introducing placing them on the floor. When a water wheel is placed horizontally like this and put in an encased area so it does not escape, and uh, rampage across the zoo, you have the teeth, once again, same direction, and you can place some nice water in to flow around, but water, quite annoyingly, flows in two directions. So, the way you fix that is place a block in a corner. You're going to want it to be in the corner where you could imagine the flow would sort of stop. Place your water bucket here, and as it flows all the way around, you get a 320 SU speed. Instead of this pitiful 256 SU speed, this is much more desirable. And if you're hanging somewhere where it's a little hotter, don't despair, even in the absence of water, lava will spin your wheel just fine. And uh, these are fireproof, because why not? Okay, so now we're producing rotational force, and we know that there are better ways and worse ways to do it. What does 256 SU even mean? What does 300 SU even mean? Well, SU is a rotational network's maximum capacity for stress. Take the humble mechanical press, one of the first machines you're probably ever going to use. When you actually use it, and by the way, you can extend rotational force with a shaft, when you actually use it in a system, and add power to it, you'll see it begins to spin, and if I hover over this, it consumes 128 SU. So, of the 256 SU we have, 128 of it is being eaten by this little guy right here, or a relatively large guy. I could add one more, but if I add a third, it's overstressed. There is not enough SU in this network to support three, so I gotta break them. However, our phenomenal and amazing 320 could probably do the trick, but uh, you can't place a press horizontally. Hmm. See, we now know what SU means and how rotational force is required to power machines, but what if you do have rotational force that's pointing upwards and you want it to be pointing sideways? Well, you got two options, large cog wheels or gear boxes. And by the way, a horizontal gear box can be crafted into a vertical gear box by just placing it into a crafting table. Large cogwheels just attached to something, they're big, they're cogwheels, they spin. But they have a wonderful ability that when you aim at the side of them, you get this little hologram of a vertical facing cogwheel. And oh, now our power is facing horizontally. We've moved it upwards. But if you're not so much a fan of spending the eight Laramar necessary to do this and also spreading cogwheels everywhere, you could just as easily use a vertical gearbox. You just want to make sure it's oriented in the direction you want. You could even use a Wii shaft to 
spread the love a little further, and there we go. Now this only costs four Laramar, because it costs, as you can see, four little cog wheels, which cost only one Laramar gem. So you save on Laramar when you're using gearboxes to move rotational force. Oh, and by the way, uh, 320 is not 128 times three, so this still can't take another third one. But my point still stands, you get a little bit more stress and it spins a little bit faster. You can see they take up 160 because they're spinning faster. The faster it spins, the more stress it takes, the faster it processes. Well, now I can hear you all saying, how do I add more SU? Well, with the water wheel, it's actually pretty simple. Add another water wheel. Boop. There we go. Beautiful. Water wheels will connect with one another and create a massive mess if you don't contain them. That's, you know, you always got to put your water wheels in containment. They love to make messes. Uh, and you will see as I patch this thing up, this water wheel is producing 160 SU while this is pro producing 256. That's because this water wheel is kind of feeding off of the other one, right? It's got random water flowing over it, but if we grab our handy dandy water bucket and start to fill this guy in a little more, give it some proper rotation, it's still at 160 because we haven't given it soul sand yet. With soul sand in place and all water source blocks, bam, 256, meaning we have 512 stress units on this network. Let's say you're not terribly keen on doing all that math. Make a stressometer and it will tell you how much stress units you have in a rotational network. It has a visual gauge where you don't need the goggles as well as some nice numbers gauge if you have the goggles on. And when you do, you can place anything next to it. The little gauge goes up and you can see that we have 384 remaining SU with our kinetic stress being subtracted by 128 by this little guy. Beautiful. Now there are more ways to produce SU in Create Mod, mainly the windmill. Now this bad boy is way more expensive than the water wheel, but that's because it can produce up to 8.1 thousand SU, all on its own. Well, not exactly on its own. You need sails, specifically 128 of them, to get the maximum possible windmill speed. To create the windmill is really easy. Place down a windmill bearing, and you see the sticky side? Attach a block to it. Give it a few sails. You're going to want to make sure it looks nice and pretty because if your build doesn't look pretty, it doesn't work. It's just a fact. Don't quote me on it. You can even use these nice little phantom guides to help you place. The more sails you place, the faster it spins, the more stress unit it has. You don't need 128 of them. And you'll see if I right click that already with only 12 of these, it's spinning very slowly, but with 512 SU. It took us two water wheels to get there. I can right click it again to stop it and add even more sales to the system and you'll see very quickly and for relatively cheap, I mean this stuff is sticks wool and an andesite, and an andesite alloy, uh, you will get a lot of SU if I could ever place them in the right order. Bam. Now we have 1,536. All right, all right, we can make SU, we understand SU, let's get into using it. And the first thing I'll show you is actually the press. Ooh, convenient, because the press is how you get sheets. If you want these fancy dancy goggles of mine, you're gonna need golden sheets. Pretty simply, you're gonna take yourself a gold ingot and throw it underneath the press. And, ta-da, it presses it into a gold sheet. Beautiful. Now, if you're not too keen on throwing your items on the floor, might I introduce to you the depot. Very easily, an andesite alloy and an andesite casing, you get a depot. A depot can be placed underneath most machines that require items to be on the ground, and you can place items into them. See, they become little and cute, and you can right-click the items out of them. I could take a stack of gold ingots, right-click it onto the depot, and they will sit there with no threat of despawning, and you can see the uh, the items will be processed right under the press, and they'll be popped off. Now, if you right-click on it, you take everything out of it, so I'd wait until the stack is done, or whatever you put on is done, and very slowly this guy will press and press and press and press and give you all the gold sheets you could ever want. Bit of a JEI tutorial. Whenever you see something with this pressing recipe, that is what it's talking about. Place this under a press and it turns into this. Oh, and one thing you're probably gonna see me use at this video is a creative motor. You of course don't have this in survival mode. It just gives me some infinite spinny spin power that I don't need to set up, you know, windmills or water wheels for, and it'll make the episode a little more cohesive for you guys. Oh, and one more note, there is another way to produce SU with steam engines, but it is much more complicated than water wheels and windmills, so I won't be covering it in a basics video. All right, back to the content. 
this is pretty cool, but I know something cooler. Remember how these andesite casings cost literally a block of chromatic iron? That's nine chromatic iron. That's a lot of chromatic iron, especially because almost all of your machines is going to require the chromatic iron, and it's a beautiful decoration block that has connected textures. I mean, you're going to want a lot of this. Well, guess what? Create actually has a way for you to get more chromatic iron out of your chromatic iron by crushing it in two giant wheels. You can see we put nine raw chromatic iron and get 18 raw chromatic or 18 chromatic iron dust. You put in one ore, you get two chromatic dust. You put in one raw ore, you get two chromatic dust. Always do the raw ores because this is affected by fortune. And if you hit it with fortune three, the average is two raw ores, meaning you're actually quadrupling your chromatic iron instead of doubling. So hot tip there. Crushing wheels are not at all expensive, but you do need two of them because one on its own is just a big old wheel. And now, of course, the first problem in create many people face is how do you get these set up? Because if they're rotating in the same exact way, it's not going to work. You can use these little cogwheels and their phantom cogwheels to place a line of cogwheels together, but you can see that just ends up spinning them in the same direction because, you know, rotations and opposites. So this doesn't work. Obviously, this is never going to crush anything. It's just going to sadly grind away. There are two basic ways that people use to make cogwheels spin properly. That's with large cogwheels and gearboxes. The large cogwheel method is pretty simple and looks pretty cute. Large cogwheel on both of them. One guy in the center there. Give it some rotational force. Make sure it's actually rotating. And, uh, well, they're spinning opposite to one another. With my little creative motor, I can actually invert the spin speed. But if you're using something like a water wheel or something else, there's a few ways you could invert spin speed yourself. For one, if you hold shift while placing a water wheel, it actually rotates in a different direction. Gearboxes actually change the direction a shaft is rotating. You can see it's rotating to the right here, and now it's rotating to the left. And a gear shift, which is pretty cheap and easy to make, when given a redstone signal, boop, will invert the direction of rotation as well. And this one is great because it's toggleable and a lot cheaper than a gearbox. But if you're cheating like me, you could just change the speed. So this is pretty cool. The other method is really easy. Gearboxes. Remember how I said they invert rotation? Yeah. One gearbox rotates into another, and they change the rotation, so you've got wheels that are crushing into each other. In Vault Hunters, use the gearbox method. You see, a large cogwheel costs four Laramar each. That's 12 Laramar. A gearbox costs four Laramar each, but you only need to use two of them. You save four Laramar using gearboxes. And to some, this is a lot cleaner because it doesn't stick out so much. All right, now you've got your delicious stack of chromatic iron ore. Let's get it into the crushing wheels. Eh. Oh, wait, no, okay. All right, crushing wheels. Ah. Uh-huh, there we go. Okay, pretty annoying that you could miss. What if you never missed? Introducing the noble shoot. For a cost of two iron sheets and two andesite alloy, you get an amazing little function of create. If you place it on top of your crushing wheels and give it a wee little chest above it, you will never, ever, 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 ever miss throwing your ores into anything. You see, shoots have the unique ability to drop items straight down from any inventory they're connected to or any other shoot. If I put this andesite in my inventory, put it in there, it falls directly into the center of the block, which is extremely useful because a lot of create processes require items to be thrown on the ground or put in specific places. One big drawback of your chute is that it only drops a few items at a time, maximum of four. And if you have a ton of items in a chest, that could get annoying. All you gotta do is upgrade to a smart chute, which is decently expensive and does require you to have made an electron tube, which requires you to make polished rose quartz. Polished rose quartz can confuse some people. You need to make the actual rose quartz as well as make something called sandpaper. That's just sand and paper. I don't need to show that. And when you have sandpaper and rose quartz, one of them goes in your offhand, one of them goes in your onhand. Hold right click like you're eating, and you make some polished rose quartz. Ooh. Also, our chromatic iron dust is done. So, what a great way to show off that the smart shoot drops one stack at a time. And it even has a wonderful filter. You can actually tell it to drop a certain amount of items at a time by scrolling your mouse wheel while looking at the filter. So only 10 at once. I don't know why you'd want that, but it's great for regulating things. You could also use an item to filter out. So that's not a chest. There's the chest filter. Only chests will drop out of this. Cool, right? Okay, so you've got your chromatic iron. You're not going to miss throwing it into your chutes, but now you need to smelt up 128 chromatic iron dust. That is going to take forever. 
not with the encased fan, an amazing little feature of Create that is super a duper useful. This little guy has so many uses, it is ridiculous. By default, when you power the fella, it will blow air. It'll blow entities too. If you invert the signal to it, it will suck air, pulling entities to it. And the higher SU it's been given, the faster and farther it will blow. You can make these crazy little, uh, you can make a little, uh, I don't know, you can make a little obstacle course with it or blow items all over the ground. You can see it, a whoosh, so fun. But we can actually use this to blast smelt items. Grab yourself a bucket of lava and make sure to enclose the space you're working in. Place the lava down and it spits fire. You're also probably going to want to keep that lava at bay as well. If the trapdoor is closed, it will block the stream, but an open trapdoor will keep your lava nice and safe in there and will not block the stream of flame. I also recommend keeping a little enclosure for where your items are actually going to end up, and you can toss full stacks of items, and you'll see they get blown away. That's why you want a blockage. And after a very short while, considering how many items are on there, the entire stack will smelt. No fuel and much less time. And just like that, you've smelted 128 items. Now, the fan spinning faster does not actually change how fast it will smelt items. It only changes how long. So you could have these guys running at like 1, one RPM and uh, they'll smelt the exact same. Yeah, pretty nice. But our fan friend here can do a whole lot more. Give the little guy water, and he will wash your items. Whenever you see this bulk washing tab, you can see what items can be washed into. Sand can be washed into clay balls. Red sand can be washed into gold nuggets and dead bushes. That's a gold farm. And there are plenty of other washing recipes as well. Lava is too hot for food, but put a campfire and you'll smoke it, cooking large stacks of food items. And for a little spooky magic in your life, you can haunt things like cobblestone into blackstone or ink sacks into glowing sacks. Whenever you see these symbols, a bulk blasting symbol, a bloke haunting symbol, a bulk washing symbol, and a bulk smoking symbol, know that you've got an encased fan, what needs to be in front of it, and what turns into what. This is very useful and will help you produce a lot of hard to get items. All right, we've got things that stamp. We've got things that crush. We've got things that blow and haunt and cook and smelt and wash. Oof, that's a lot. Do we have something that acts as a player? Right-clicking and left-clicking? Oh, yes. Using another electron tube and a brass hand, you can make a deployer, which is a funky little finger attached to some andesite. Give this guy some rotational power, and he'll just point and point and point. I don't think there's anything interesting over there. Uh, but what is interesting is all the different things this can do. Give it a block and it will place it down. Cool. Give it a sword, and it will attack. No, it won't. This fun fella is actually the first item on our list that can be interacted with by the wrench, which changes the properties of an item. You see, right now it's on mode use. If I right-click with the wrench, it turns into mode attack, and it wields that sword with a bit more gusto and Oof, and ouch, that hurts. Say you want to make a little leaf farm. Well, an empty deployer doesn't do anything, but give it some shears. A boop. And it will break the leaf. How cool. Uh, but it stopped. That's because it has the leaf inside of it. So you can actually use a hopper or any other item to take stuff out, and you'll see it will take the leaf out. It'll also take out the shears, so you'll probably want a shoot or something to filter. And get this. It can automate the process of creating casings. Give it an andesite alloy, and definitely don't have it in attack mode. Give the funky fella an andesite alloy and place one of these bad boys in front of it, and it'll automatically convert it into the casing. Plonk a hopper facing into it, fill it up with some andesite, and you've got yourself a bona fide automatic andesite casing farm. You just have to do all the breaking and the placing. Mm, there's got to be a better way. Huh, that's a weird bug. I've never had that. Ha okay, well, ignore that. That usually doesn't happen, and I have no idea how I did that, but apparently I'm god. Anyways, that better way of doing it is belts. Mechanical belts. Not waxed exposed copper. Belts attached to shafts. Like this. You only need one belt to do that. You wouldn't need three. Now you've got 
Mm, a belt. What does a belt do? A lot. Belts transport items. You can throw an item onto it, and the item will move along the belt and pop off at the end. Or if you place a block, it will not pop off at the end, and it will wait to be put inside of something. Uh, or it'll do that unless you have a block on the bottom, too. Check this out, though. It's rotating on this side. A belt will move rotational power to wherever you place shafts inside of it. So you could have a horizontal rotational power be spread all the way across. Really awesome. And best of all, for our purposes, belts help us automate stuff like deployers and presses and even crushing wheels if you place them horizontally alongside the belt. If we get our deployer a deploying and give it a whole big stack of andesite alloy and toss a whole big stack of this chromatic iron goodness, it will automatically deploy onto the full stack. And every time it does so, only the casing will move because items that can be processed will stop on the belt until they're processed and get to move along and we get to pop off all of our andesite casing. But uh, once again, there's got to be a better way of actually putting items onto the belt. It'd be pretty annoying to have to click stacks onto them and sit there picking them up so they don't despawn. Welcome to the wacky world of funnels. There's an andesite funnel and a brass funnel, which is a lot more expensive. Brass, we'll get into how to make that in a second, don't worry. Funnels are going to attach to inventories and be on the sides of belts. We can place an inventory here and an inventory here, and we can put an andesite funnel on either side. Now, these funnels are not directional because they're attached directly to a belt. They're going to pull items when the belt moves away from them and push items when the belt enters into them. And this is the same for brass funnels. The only difference is brass funnels have a filter slot and they can move up to a stack of items. Note that if you have an inventory right here and you put a funnel on it, you'll see this guy has an arrow. Now, when an item passes through, it's going to go inside of the chest because the arrow is facing into it. If we slap a right click with a wrench, now the andesite is going to pull items out of the chest, put them on the belt here, and move them along the way. I can now give my andesite alloy to the deployer, and of course I could put like a hopper and put hundreds of thousands of into it. Drop our chromatic iron blocks, they'll all come out at once, stop on the belt ready to be processed, and will be sucked up by the chest or the funnel that goes into the chest and now this is pretty automatic so how do we actually make brass well we need to mix and this is a few steps of a process for starters you're going to need a mechanical mixer and a whisk to make that a basin which is pretty simple and something called an empty blaze burner all things you should be able to make at this point you're going to place your blaze burner down, your basin down, and your mechanical mixer down. And notice the mechanical mixer does not have a shaft input. No, no, no. You need to use a cog. All right, that's easy, you say. You place down your cog, you place down your motor, and uh, speed requirement. It appears that this mechanical mixer is not rotating with enough speed. And if you're using water wheels or windmills, yeah, that's pretty tough. You can't just scroll and make it go faster. You have to gear ratio. A gear ratio occurs when a large cogwheel is put into a small cogwheel. You can see the large cogwheel is spinning at half the speed of the small one. If we were to place a speedometer on the small one, we have an RPM of 32, despite the fact that we are inputting a 16 RPM. Neat trick about the little mixer here is it counts as a small cogwheel. So we can actually gear ratio directly into it. We don't have to use a small cogwheel. Now to make brass, all we have to do is toss in a zinc ingot and a copper ingot. And zinc, by the way, is just mined from the ground. But you'll see nothing actually happens, especially if you miss your shot, um, because you need heat. This is an empty blaze burner. Well, apparently if you middle click it, it turns into a full blaze burner, but you are going to be creating an empty blaze burner that needs to be filled. Pretty easily, just find a blaze shift right click it turns into a blaze burner uh or you could right click a blaze spawner but you can see he's looking a little sad and still nothing is happening blazes like most people will not work for free you have to feed them hot things to heat them up and once you do blah, 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 you get two brass ingots from your mixer this is heated mixing not all mixing recipes require heat but those that do 
you gotta feed your blaze burner. There are more complex mixing recipes that require a blaze cake, but I'll let you guys figure out how to make that on your own. All right, let's expand slightly on those basics with the filter item. Really cheap to make and very versatile. A filter is a filter. You can drag items directly from JEI into it, which makes it super amazing. You can set it to an allow list, meaning it will only allow these items, or a deny list, meaning it will allow everything but these items. You could have it ignore or respect data, that means if you put, like, a broken sword into this, you could have it say that all swords, regardless of whether they're broken, can go through. Or if you want it to respect data, only swords that have exactly the same NBT data. If you need a little advice, you know, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll, you can hold shift there. You could also clear your filter like that and make sure to save your filter with a check mark. And just to show you the recipe, super duper cheap. Another expansion on the basics are tunnels. An andesite tunnel and a brass tunnel. An andesite tunnel is only good for one thing. A stack of items go in, one item comes out one side, the rest of the stack goes out the other side. They could also be used as little decorations and stuff, and, uh, you know, if you have three of them in a row, you get a cute little uh, tunnel thing. So, these are mostly decorative. They do that one little weird thing. I, I truly don't know why that would be useful. It's the brass tunnels that really take the cake. When you throw a stack of items onto them, by default, they'll split the stack straight down the middle, right in half. But while holding the wrench and viewing the top of them, you can actually change what they do. You can have them force split or round robin or forced round robin or prefer the nearest or randomize or scrunch inputs or all these different crazy things that I'll let you discover on your own. Then one of the even more useful things that they can do is actually split lanes. They can go horizontally with one another. So a full stack of items goes in and they will split the stack down two lanes, which is great for certain long-form processing. And, of course, the brass ones can be filtered. So, we could say that brass tunnels can... This brass tunnel only spits out the brass block, and this brass tunnel only spits out belts. So, when I throw these brass blocks on, they will only come out of that tunnel, and I could spit a belt out of that one, which is great for machines that have multiple exits. Or, well, outputs. And one fun last thing, right-clicking your belts with a casing will decorate them. Same thing with your big cog wheels, same thing with your little cog wheels, and same thing with your shafts. It will decorate all of them. Alrighty, that is going to do it for the absolute basics of Create. If you guys want to see tutorials on more advanced concepts, like rotating machines, minecart stuff, steam generators and other random nonsense that create can do let me know in the comments and like this video that'll tell me that this is the kind of content that you were looking for vault hunter specific create mod guides and also general stuff um this is something new that i'm trying out and i'd really appreciate all your feedback on how i did uh like comment subscribe youtube stuff algorithm away